So today I'm going to speak, start speaking mostly about exponential sums over finite fields. Uh, before I begin with that, I'll just uh, once more do a quick uh, computation to explain uh, so where do these sums come from. So yesterday I kind of did some computation that was suggestive, but maybe a bit difficult to follow because it was embedded in this all complicated uh, style of argument uh, in Zhang's uh, distribution estimate. So let me write kind of a really basic case similar to the case of the divisor function that we saw. And then I'll start talking about exponential sums. Okay, so the first thing we saw was this ordinary divisor function. So when we look at uh, divisor function in arithmetic progressions, and one way to think about this, after we do all the usual uh, subdivision in intervals and uh, localization and smoothing, so we have something like uh, sum over two variables congruent to a mod Q and say that they have certain sizes, capital M and capital M. And in the case of just the ordinary divisor function, the point is uh, we're really summing the function one, or in a slightly more abstract way, uh, you would think of uh, alpha and beta n, where both are smooth, nice smooth functions. And then uh, how the exponential sums come in, how the clue sum and sums come in was very direct. You just apply Poisson summation in both variables, and we ended up with a sum where there might be some other smooth functions and so on, but essentially, um, yeah, we got sum over h of uh, this Kluster and sum. So there was two dual variables, h1 and h2. I don't write the ranges. They would be q over m and q over n. And uh, we had h1, h2, a bar uh, over q. And in a very direct way, with maybe some other coefficients, which are also smooth. OK, and the origin of this sum is no mystery. It's just the discrete Fourier transform of the characteristic function modulo q uh, in z mod q z squared of the condition mn congruent to a mod q. So, so it's really Fourier transform. of the characteristic function of the set mn in z mod q squared, such that mn is a mod q. Okay. So even if it looks mysterious at first sight, it's really something that's quite straightforward in principle. So now let's look at, uh, let's say, primes and similar functions in arithmetic progressions. And kind of the core of the argument is always something like that. Uh, we have now general bilinear forms to deal with after applying bilinear decompositions. Where well, now we don't know what happens with alpha M and beta. Okay, so they are purely arbitrary. Except for their sizes, which are under control, we cannot quite. Uh, apply the Poisson summation because it doesn't make sense to apply Poisson summation if you have coefficients which are completely arbitrary. So the uh, essence of some of the beginning steps in the proof uh, of the theorem of Fouvry, Vagnetz, and Bombier, Ferrandori, Vagnetz, and Zhang is by some manipulations with Cauchy Schwartz, you first eliminate one of the two non smooth variables, let's say alpha m, or in other words, you replace this alpha m, which was now arbitrary, by something that's smooth. And now if you do this, uh, you can kind of see where you're going to end out. We're going to try and do the same type of analysis. Now we can do Poisson summation or completion in the m variable, because it's still OK. But we have this bad coefficient that we have to deal with otherwise. So we do it in the following way. So we sum over n first. Then um, the completion in the m variable will give you a Fourier expansion of the type gamma m of h 
say I do it modulo Q and not with Fourier, with uh, Poisson summation, uh, E of, well, uh, I'm summing over M, so M is uh, A and bar over Q, something like that. So the gamma M's are very well behaved, they're essentially smooth and they're very small on average, but we still have this beta N, but we can at this point, as usual, get rid of the non-smooth variable by the Cauchy uh, formula. So if I call capital B the original sum, I get that B squared is at most the norm of beta squared times the sum over N of the modulus of the sum over H squared. And now if we exchange the sums, we're going to get the norm of beta squared, which is under control, and then H1 and H2 with some coefficients which are nicely behaved, essentially smooth. And now the other sum becomes sum over N of size capital N, E of A N bar H1 minus H2 over Q. And the point is now this sum is become, uh, again, with coefficients 1 or essentially smooth, so yeah. Uh, right, a, I forgot the H, yes. So here I forgot H everywhere. Yeah, sorry. Right. So it's A and bar H1 minus H2 because I had forgotten the H here in my uh, Fourier expansion. Is that okay? What? Uh, right, you're right. You're absolutely right. Okay, let me do this a bit more carefully. I'll just use another blackboard then. And so I have to restart from here. Okay, so I'll do this more carefully. Then you have the sum over H, gamma M of H. Uh, and we want to now compute. The, uh, so N is fixed now. So M is a n bar over Q, and we're computing the Fourier transform of this thing, and so there's going to be a single term. That's the point. So E of uh, A n bar H over Q. Okay. So here I'm thinking that I'm summing over, for fixed n, I'm summing over M, but it's a characteristic function of a single point. So free transform is a single additive character evaluated at every H. Okay, and these are the Fourier coefficients of the interval in the length of M. Is that okay? So norm of B squared. So you would have to write exactly what it is to see that this really picks up what you want. So the point is it's not just discongruent, but also the fact that M is of this size that, that you want to combine together. Okay, so sum over N, modulus sum over H squared, which is norm beta squared, sum over H1, H2, the sum over N, e H1 minus H2, and bar of Q. And this is an incomplete sum still. So if, if there was just N over all things modulo Q, this would be a Ramanujan sum that's easy, but it's an incomplete sum and the range could be quite small. Uh, so in any case, we complete again. So because the coefficient is one, we can do Fourier expansion there. So you get in the end something like Going to be three variables, which are uh, okay, and I forgot the Fourier coefficients. Now there will be three gamma n h three, 
And the Fourier transform is now the sum over all n of E of A H1 minus H2 n bar plus uh, H3 n over Q. And this is a Klusterman sum again. Okay, it's a special feature. As you will see in the example I'll give later of the ternary divisor function, even if I didn't discuss too much how it goes, I will explain how you get sometimes more complicated exponential sums. If you start with the ternary divisor case of this type of computations, uh, the fact that between the smooth, completely smooth case and this kind of one non-smooth variable, the exponential sum that arise are the same, like the old clue sum and sum. This is a very specific feature of the fact uh, that we end up having just one free variable, as we'll see later. So this is still a clue sum and sum. Okay, so that's a good point to say uh, one last remark about these things of of Zhang and uh, the earlier works of Fouvry, Vanietz, and Bombiri, Friedlander, Vanietz. So everything I said yesterday, I never used uh, anything about A. So everything was uniform in terms of A. So that's what we wanted. Now, uh, one can see here kind of the type of uh, things that may arise if you don't think that you want uniformity in A. And uh, you can try and then do things with these uh, custom sums which will start using the size of A. And that's actually where the size of A was used in these earlier works, which made them unsuitable for the GPY method. So uh, the point is, it's not because you have good exponential sums with good squared cancellation properties that you're done. So the feature of the thing is that uh, this might still be completely insufficient to prove uh, the exponential distribution that you want. And so here, the idea is to try and exploit more variables. They're still of these all the other parameters and we want to gain averages over all these other parameters. And so what fouvry vanietz did, and then Bombieri, Friedlander, Ivanietz, so one thing that is tempting from this type of formula, if you think that there's going to be other sum, or here, if you don't want to apply directly Poisson summation in this n sum, uh, there's a nice identity which says that if you have two integers which are co-prime, let's say a and n, then uh, a bar n minus a minus n bar a is 1 over a n, modulo 1. Okay. So it's a funny identity. So A is viewed as modulo n and co-prime to n, and this is the inverse of A modulo n. Here n is viewed as uh, modulo A and co-prime to A. This is the inverse of n modulo A. And here A and n are viewed as real numbers, and this is the inverse of the product. So it's very easy to see. So this means that if you have any kind of rational functions of this type, you can switch uh, numerator and denominator, and this is efficient if uh, a of n, let's say, or 1 at least, is relatively big because E of 1 over a n is going to be quite small. Okay. And from this point of view, uh, you can do things, but uh, it's going to be inefficient in some cases. Uh, it's going to start using the size of a if you continue with things like summation by parts. So this is where, uh, in the original paper of fouvry vanietz and it was continued later on, uh, they would use this type of tricks and then do summation by parts with respect to uh, the coefficient a. And if you do summation by parts with the coefficient, then its size it matters. Yeah. Is that a plus here? It's a plus. OK, thanks. <laughs> All right. OK, so this is just to give you an idea. If you look at my Bobaki report on Zhang's work, I, I give a very precise reference that Fouvry gave me where he just points out precisely where in the earliest works uh, such things were used. And then it turns out that uh, you have very powerful estimates for short sums of incomplete custom and sums like that coming from spectral methods of automorphic forms. And this is another source of losing uniformity in A. But it's already a, this uniformity in A is already lost even if you don't do that, when, when this type of manipulations is performed.
So loses uniformity Okay, so that's just one final remark. And now I'm going to start the next part of my uh, lectures. So it's, I guess, section four, which is exponential sums. Okay, and at this point, even if you didn't follow or you were a little bit bored with this exponential of distribution stuff where you don't always have very clear motivations for the various steps, uh, you can uh, switch on again. Because these techniques are very important uh, in many, many other areas of number theory besides uh, these problems about distribution of prime design space progression. And they're also important in other fields like theoretical computer science. Uh, and even sometimes in strange ways, uh, for instance, Boumbieri and Bourguin have solved the problem in pure harmonic analysis using uh, in particular, exponential sums of fields. So these are many uses besides uh, what we discussed up to now. The study of L functions, many, many other things uh, use these techniques. OK, so we have seen uh, examples like Klusterman sums. I'll write again the definition. There were the Gauss sums. So the star means co-prime with C. So examples of that, uh, Gauss sums. So the sum of chi of x, E of x over P, for instance. Uh, you can have Jacobi sums. So here you have two characters, and you do something like chi1 of x, chi2 of 1 minus x. Modulo c, let's say x modulo c. So these are basic examples, and they tend to come up in many applications, many situations, and more complicated sums often come up. And uh, so it turns out that one can uh, get uh, very strong. So in many cases, uh, optimal as long as you don't let other parameters vary, uh, individual bounds for such sums uh, using results from algebraic geometry. over finite fields. OK, it's, it's something that still, I think, uh, one can consider to be quite mysterious why this should be the case. It's one of these very nice things in mathematics, connections between very different areas. So uh, the first idea is always to try to uh, decompose the sums using some kind of multiplicativity to reduce from the general modulus case to prime powers and uh, often just to prime. So in particular, uh, in this GPY method and many other similar problems we see, uh, you only have moduli which are uh, square free numbers. And then just the Chinese remainder theorem always gives you some kind of factorization of the sum over the square free modulus to a sum, to a product of sums over primes. So I'm justifying why this should be just finite fields that we should concentrate on in the first approximation uh, instead of arbitrary z modulo c z or z modulo q z. So uh, the Chinese remainder theorem uh, factors such sums 
So you can think of these three examples, and, and uh, when I'm going to state the first big theorem in this area, there'll be very general sums, and uh, my modulus will be prime, but you just replace this modulus by an arbitrary modulus, and uh, this would still be a, something where you can apply these change remainder theorems to sums where uh, C is a power of a prime. Okay, so for instance, it's an interesting uh, example to do explicitly. Uh, suppose I have so a Clouston ensemble modulo product C1, C2, where C1 and C2 are co-prime. So if you had an arbitrary modulus, you would split it as a product of powers of primes and apply this inductively to all the factors. Then you have this thing called twisted multiplicativity, which says that you get AC1 bar BC1 bar modulo C2 times S AC2 bar BC1 C2 bar, sorry, modulo C1. Okay, so again, uh, C1 bar is the inverse modulo C2 and C2 bar is the inverse modulo C1, which are well defined because they're co prime. Okay, it's an elementary exercise and this gives you the typical shape of this thing. So it's not straight multiplicativity in terms of the modulus. Some of the other parameters are going to change. Yeah. Yeah, that's the time. Absolutely. That's multiplication. Yeah, yeah. Which you can guess because here there's about C1 times C2 terms in the product, in, uh, in the sum. So here there should be also something like that. Yeah, it's a multiplication. Okay? And here, uh, for instance, so this looks innocuous, but in Philippe Michel's thesis, uh, he has remarkable applications to changes of signs of Lusum and sums. Uh, modulo integers with few prime factors. That, that's uh, a very nice application of this thing, plus the idea that the inverses of uh, something tend to vary in a very random way, and other uh, facts which combine to lead to some very nice results. Okay? okay. So this is often called twisted multiplicativity. Uh, so this is the first step. And then the second step is, well, if you have a square free modulus, then you're done because this already will split it into a mo things modulo primes. I mean, you're not done, but you've reduced to primes. So uh, the other thing is that if C is a power of a prime, where k is at least two, there is very often, not always, but very often, uh, easier methods work. than for k equals one. And the idea is always the same. Uh, if we want to sum something modulo p squared, we sum first over what is the reduction of the something modulo p, and then we sum over the uh, elements which reduce to that. So I'll just write, uh, you write the sum over x, let's say modulo p um, k, of anything, let's say k of x, to be the sum over a modulo p. So k is defined and periodic modulo p to the k, so I cannot put anything else. But then you sum over b modulo p to the k minus 1 of k of uh, a plus uh, p times uh, b. So it's just a decomposition uh, of z modulo p to the kz in terms of what it is modulo p plus what remains. And so uh, either by some kind of induction or very often just by writing this sum and for some reason in many cases they are very easy to do, uh, you get a much easier handle on certain sums. So for instance, as an exercise, from this it's very easy to deduce the analog or the case of the vile bound for Clouston and sums uh, when the modulus is p to the k and k is at least 2. So exercise. Maybe you need uh, p to be different from 2, let's say, but k is at least 2. Then from this, it's not difficult to find a proof that 
the Kluster-Mann sum is at most twice uh, p to the power k over 2. Um, if uh, a and b are coprime from p. So based on this, uh, in many cases, this reduces to uh, the uh, most difficult case, which will be when you sum over a modulo p and you do not have this extra variable to play with. So for the remainder, essentially, of all these lectures, I'm going to just concentrate on that case. So, so in, in actual practice, this reduction step, especially if your uh, modulus has many powers of primes, can be much more painful than it suggests because there are many exceptional cases that you have to control in a multiplicative way. And so it's not always as easy as I maybe make it look like. But even when it's hard, some other techniques are very different. Okay, so we concentrate now. C equals P, A prime. I mean, in some sense, when you apply these to study prime numbers, uh, what this is of telling you is that uh, among the many different definitions of prime numbers, I mean, maybe there are not so many of them, so you can think maybe of inclusion exclusion, which rise, gives rise to sieve methods. You can think of the, think of the fundamental, fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which some sense gives rise to zeta functions and, and such multiplicative techniques. Or you can think that a prime number is just the characteristic of a finite field, and this gives rise to these uh, other things. It's, it's less easy to see why this should help you count primes, but it turns out to be the case. OK, so uh, this depends on algebraic geometry. I'm going to start by stating the first uh, strong and very useful result in this direction, a fairly general form of the estimates of André Weil. And then I will give examples and explain some things about that. And tomorrow I will give some examples and motivation coming from uh, more sophisticated types of exponential sums. Uh, for which one needs the work of the lean. So the first main theorem in this area, so due to André Weil in, uh, I guess, 1948, or something like that, is the following statement. So we're going to take a prime and we're going to look at the sum which is quite a general exponential sum, modulo p, uh, generalizing somehow this, this type of examples. So we will put some additive character uh, with a fairly general rational function as an argument. And because you see here that sometimes the multiplicative characters appear or are mixed, I'm going to also put a multiplicative character with some other general rational function. So let's say we have chi of g1 of x uh, g2 of x inverse, so the one argument will be the rational function g1 divided by g2. And then I will have some additive things with f1 of x divided by f2 of x, modulo p. So here you have to think that you sum modulo p uh, where this makes sense, so you need to assume that g2 is non zero uh, to avoid dividing by zero, or you could write chi of g1 times chi bar of g2, and then you would just not necessarily have to worry about that too much, but let's do it this way. And you need f2 to be non-zero. Okay, we will typically think of cases where the degrees of these things are fixed, and p will be some variable tending to infinity. So this will exclude only finitely many, provided the numerator and denominator are non-zero, which I will now add as a condition on this data for some, so f1, f2, g1, g2 will be polynomials with coefficient in the finite field fp, so fp, z modulo pz, with, so f1 co-prime with f2, g1 co-prime with g2, and uh, f2 non-zero, 
g2 non-zero as polynomials. And an extra assumption is, well, k is a multiplicative character, which could be the trivial one. modulo p. And now we have to be a little tiny bit careful because suppose, for instance, that uh, g2 is 1, g1 is a square, and k is of order 2. Then I'm not going to get cancellation for ridiculous reasons, and we want to avoid that type of thing to make a clean statement. So we're going to assume that if k is of order d, meaning that k to the power d is a trivial character, but uh, smaller uh, powers are not, uh, then uh, we're going to assume that there's uh, g1 and g2 are not these powers, or in other words, that there is, uh, there's at least one zero of g1 or g2, which is not of order divisible by d. And if k is trivial, I'm actually going to insist that g1 is g2 is 1, which is anyway the way it would come up uh, in applications. So I'll take g1 equals g2 equals 1 if k is 1. And... Uh, in fact, you can assume that uh, so all zeros of G1 and G2 are of order multiplicity uh, one less than uh, order, uh, strictly less than the um, order of chi. Okay? Because even, let's say, if you have chi of order 2 and you have G1 cubed, then chi of g1 squared being 1, you can replace it by chi of g1, uh, where this condition is satisfied. OK, so these are the conditions. And with this, uh, the theorem of André Veil is that you always ask code cancellation, except when it's completely obvious that you don't. So there exists a constant C, uh, non-negative, which uh, you can write down so it's completely explicit. Depends only on the degrees of the polynomials. OK, I'll give examples of what is the value that comes up in concrete cases, such that the modulus of s is at most c times code of p, unless, well, unless you're summing something that is always constant. Okay? And to have this always constant with the conditions I have here, this means that g1 over g2 has to be constant, and uh, f1 over f2 has to be constant, as rational functions, not as numerical functions evaluated on FP, but as rational functions. So F1 over F2 and G1 over G2 are constant. Yeah. Or if you had not done this kind of preliminary reduction of the order of zeros of G1 and G2, you would say that G1 over G2 uh, is some uh, as a rational function to the power d, uh, possibly times a constant that uh, could not be equal to 1 and could be a non this power. Okay? So it's a really extremely powerful. That's this. So the original proof of André Veil is uh, based on difficult algebraic geometry. I mean, relatively standard algebraic geometry by today's standards, but completely uh, uh, new in some sense algebraic geometry at the time of his proof. Nowadays, there are elementary proofs of this estimate. So there are elementary proofs 
using what is known as Stepanov's method. So I think there'll be a talk about this tomorrow, so I won't say more about that. I think the, the most general uh, reference for that is a lecture notes by uh, Wolfgang Schmidt. So if you are curious about looking at a place where this is done in complete general, I mean, in this type of generality using this method of Stepanov, uh, there's this book by Wolfgang Schmidt. Okay. Uh, except for very special cases, uh, there is no more direct proof than uh, going through the Stepanov method. So let me give basic examples which are doable without that. So uh, there's the modulus of the Gauss sum that was seen a number of times. So for a non-trivial character, the modulus of a Gauss sum is always code of P. Uh, this is a special case of this estimate, more precise because it's an equality for the modulus and not an inequality. Uh, one can classify, in some sense, the cases where this sum would have modulus exactly square root of P, uh, at least for non-coincidental reasons. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's easy. That's what I'll explain tomorrow. I mean, if you black box Dolin's general version of the Veil conjectures, if you just take uh, Andre Veil's, if you just take uh, point counting for smooth projective varieties of fine fields, I'm not sure it's so easy because of the properness and smoothness. Thing. But if you black box the general version of Dolin's work that I'll discuss tomorrow, then this is uh, easy. So for Gauss sum, you get square root of P. For Jacobi sums, when the two characters are distinct and non-trivial, you also get square root of P. Uh, note in passing, the Jacobi sum is actually not, strictly speaking, of this kind. Okay, Because there's chi1 and chi2, and here I just put one chi. So I could very easily have written down a statement where you would have a finite number of multiplicative characters which are each distinct and which has each of them as some argument. But just writing it down makes it a bit more complicated. And again, the version I'll state tomorrow uh, would give you the correct generalization to that case with no problem. Okay? So these are two cases where it's exactly square root of p. Then one can show that the constant is equal to 1. Uh, well. This gives you that the constant equal to 1, and one can actually prove these identities uh, using the old general formalism uh, in, in a way that is relatively pointless, but at least gives good examples of applying the general formalism. Okay, so for Klusterman sums, so you have a, uh, f1 over f2 is ax plus b over x as a rational function. And so, uh, in that case, uh, you get c equal to 2. I mean, it's not obvious from this, but it, uh, one can prove this. And this gives the veil bound for Klusterman sums. Okay, and if uh, one of these is non-zero but the other is not, then it's still the case that f1 over f2 is not constant. Uh, and in that case, uh, either Raman Johnson evaluation or sums of additive characters gives you something that's even better than that. Okay, so uh, if b is zero, you would get uh, zero because you must assume then that a is non-zero. And if a is zero and b is non-zero, you get a Raman Johnson which would be of modulus minus one. Uh, so it's still less than three times root of p. So this shows that every once in a while you can get better estimate than that, but most of the, ca the time you cannot. Here's another exercise where this can be done by hand uh, in, in a way that's slightly less trivial than the case of Gauss or Jacobi sums, which are, which are above. Maybe example three. It's the so-called Salier sums. So they look very much like Lusterman sums, except that you put a Legend symbol uh, in front 
of the uh, factor that determines a Clouston ensemble. And so it turns out that these can be evaluated explicitly. So we assume that A and B are uh, not divisible by P. Then this is going to be the Gauss sum associated to the Legendre symbol. which is of modulus coat of P by what I said above, times a sum, which is clearly bounded by an absolute constant, in fact, bounded by two, and it's just the number of solutions, I'm oh, sorry, it's the sum of E of Y over P, where y, y runs over the solution of the equation Y square congruence to four times AB mod P. Uh, and actually, I should probably, yeah. No, it's fine. So it's fine. Okay. So in other words, the Salier sum is either zero, because it could be that four times AB is not a square modulo P, or if it is non-zero, it's going to be this thing, which is in fact, uh, as a completely explicit formula, this was determined by Gauss, not just the modulus, but everything, uh, times a sum of two things, each of which is a root of unity of order P. So it's only at most, so if I call T this sum, you see that t is less than 2 square root of p is obvious in that case. Okay, uh, there's one thing I don't have time to discuss, but uh, which you can find in various uh, books. Uh, there's a lot of analogies between certain exponential sums and certain special functions. So for instance, Clouston sums are well understood to be analogs over finite fields of Bessel functions. and Basically, every time you have an identity, which is really an identity between sums of finite fields, there's very often an identity between special functions, uh, which tells you uh, something very similar. So for instance, Gauss sums are the analog of the gamma function. Jacobi sums are the analog of the beta function. And the evaluation of Jacobi sums is done via Gauss sums, so the analog of the evaluation of the beta function through so gamma functions. And here, this is the analog of the uh, Bessel functions of order one half, which are well known to be elementary functions in contrast to general Bessel functions. And there's an analog of this identity, uh, which is exactly this evaluation of uh, a Bessel function of order one half uh, in terms of elementary trigonometric function. So that would be a trigonometric function, and here's some kind of gamma, some, some kind of gamma function. Okay. All right. So. Let me give some other applications. So a very classical application, which historically came uh, well before the general statement of André Vell. So the acid bound was proved uh, in the 30s, I think, by Asser, and it's about about how many solutions there are to uh, modulo P, to uh, polynomial congruences of the type uh, Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B, where A and B has are, uh, parameters such that this cubic polynomial has three distinct roots uh, in an algebraic closure of FP. So in other words, this polynomial is uh, square free. Then uh, simply using the fact that to count the squares, well, you just take, I mean, to count the square roots of a given y of a given uh, value of this cubic, you would just sum uh, 1 plus the Legend symbol of uh, x cubed plus ax plus b over p. You deduce that this is p minus ap where the absolute value of AP is bounded by a constant times code of P, which turns out to be uh, two again in this case. Okay, and so this is just because, so for a given Y, uh, the number, sorry, for a given X, excuse me, the number of Y 
for which you have this congruence is simply 1 plus uh, the cubic Legendre symbol over P. So if the cubic is 0, then y has to be 0, and that gives 1. Uh, if this cubic value is a square, then you will get 2, and otherwise you will get 1 minus 1, which is 0. Okay? And then when you sum over x, so the first thing will give you the P. And then it's not clear why we put a minus sign, but that's the right way to do it. And in any case, the other part is a, uh, uh, Legend is a character sum with uh, no additive phase and uh, G2 equal to 1, and, and G1 is this cubic polynomial, which has no root of order 2, so it satisfies the conditions uh, to apply the theorem of Andre Weyl. Okay. Also, it can be done more elementary. Here's another application that you can take as an exercise. It's roughly along the same lines, but it's uh, instructive. So it's five. And it's interesting because uh, historically, this was studied in particular by Davenport. And this was one of the first uh, applications where people started to look at really interesting exponential sums of this type beyond the classical Gauss, Jacobi, and so on sums. And uh, Davenport and others, including Asser in particular, to solve the problem I'm going to discuss, uh, started to really systematically study these sums. And I think this is where André Veil learned that these kind of things were interesting and so that this algebraic geometry of fine fields uh, would be particularly useful uh, to solve this. I mean, André Veil did not have a particularly good opinion of <laughs> these type of applications, I think, but uh, nevertheless, uh, they're quite cute. Okay, so let's do it. So the thing is the following. So suppose you have a K tuple of integers. Uh, let's say they are distinct. These have nothing to do with the K tuples that we've seen for the last two weeks. They are just distinct integers. And we are looking at how many elements there are modulo P, where uh, the shifted uh, integers by H1 up to HK are all squares modulo P. I mean, you could say this problem has kind of very small family air with the problem of the K-tuple conjecture of Ardian Littlewood, but it's really a much easier type of problem. And so there's an asymptotic formula as P goes to infinity, where everything else is fixed, that follows quite easily from this uh, theorem of André Weyl, which will tell you that, well, I mean, each of these events should appear with a probability about one half, and they look quite independent because the H's are not the same, and indeed you get an asymptotic formula of size p over 2 to the power k. And in fact, so this was proved by Davenport, I think, uh, just because he had uh, a version of the theorem of André Weyl, uh, which was weaker but sufficient to get that. If you apply the Riemann I mean, the theorem of André Weyl, you will get an asymptotic formula with an explicit remainder term depending on k, and you can then try and say, okay, what, what could be the smallest p for which this has a solution, for instance? It's quite easy to get something. Uh, So historically, this was an important problem uh, in, the, in the beginning of this theory of exponential sums of finite. Okay? And you can see that just the same work would tell you that whatever pattern of square, non-square you take for these k-shifts will appear with the same probability. Okay. Okay, so there's another very standard application which is in the uh, so-called uh, Burgess bound that I talked about yesterday, or I mentioned it yesterday, and I think there'll also be a, to a short talk on this, where presumably this will show up. Okay, now I want to give uh, two more extended remarks after these examples. I'm actually not quite sure of time. So the first one is, uh, why do people call this the Riemann hypothesis of finite fields? So what, it has, what does it have to do with the Riemann hypothesis? It's not obvious. Uh, it turns out that the Riemann hypothesis is this one-half in P to the one-half. So the uh, one-half in the bound C square root of P equals C 
p2 to one half has to do with an analog of the Riemann hypothesis. So I will describe this now um, by defining some function of s, complex variable, uh, which will be much more elementary than the Riemann zeta function, but for which the fact that all its zeros are of modulus uh, of real part one half will exactly be the translation of, or at least something that clearly implies this theorem of Andre Bay. So we do the following. So for any positive integer nu, Let's fix some finite field f p to the nu of order p to the power nu. Okay, so careful, this is not z modulo p to the nu z, of course. This is a finite field. So this is different from what we started with when the modulus was a power of a prime. And I consider uh, the trace map from fp to the nu to fp. So this is just uh, the sum of x to the power p to the power i from 0 to nu minus 1. So this is a map that has value in fp because the image is invariant under the Frobenius homomorphism where x is sent to x to the p. And the norm map from multiplicative elements, okay, it works out also for 0, so it's not so interesting which is just the products of the corresponding powers of x. So these are known to be surjective. Uh, that's not actually of importance to us. And uh, so we're going to first define from the same data that define the basic exponential sum, we'll define uh, exponential sums for every new on fp to the new. And then we'll build the generating series, which will turn out to be essentially uh, an L function in a natural sense, for which the Riemann hypothesis will correspond to Weyl's theorem. Okay, so S sub nu will be the same sum as before, except that now X runs over this extension field. So I had a chi and I can still evaluate the rational function g1 over g2 because it has coefficients in fp, so in particular in this extension. Uh, but of course the value will not be in uh, fp where I can compute the value of chi, so I use the norm to bring the value inside. Okay, and the norm is there because it's multiplicative and chi also. So the norm of g1 of x divided by g2 of x in this field, and same for the exponential, we take the trace of f1 of x times the inverse of f2 of x modulo p. So these are complex numbers, and we define the L function associated to this data. So C, uh, s is a complex variable. But the definition will be weird. I'll tell you in a second why I cannot just write maybe either of the two definitions you might want to get. So it's the, the exponential generating series formed uh, with these sums. So the exponential of, sorry, and t is really p to the minus s. So this is strange because you might want to have either an Euler product or a Dirichlet series. So this is a Dirichlet series, but certainly not the kind one tends to use uh, when writing down the zeta function or Dirichlet functions. But it turns out to be, uh, you can transform it either to a Dirichlet series or to a, uh, an Euler product. It just takes a little while and I don't want to spend too much time on that. So we just define this. Uh, it's easy to see that it converges uh, when the real part of S is larger than 1, using the trivial bound for the exponential sum, which is just the number of terms. Okay, and the analog of the function equation and the continuation uh, 
is in that case actually a fairly simple exercise, at least in many cases. So this goes back to, uh, I think, F.K. Schmidt. In many cases, uh, I think Emil Artin also, Asse also in some cases. And suddenly, in the generality I gave, it was only known to Veil. I don't know if the, the previous workers at the general form are going to state. Uh, so we have I mean, something quite nice. So we would like the zeta function to be that simple. So L of s is the inverse of a polynomial evaluated at p to the minus s. OK, so this polynomial has good properties. It has coefficients in C. Uh, the value at 0 is 1. And its degree is some constant that depends only on the degrees of the uh, original polynomials. And it's exactly actually the same constant that you want to take in the theorem of André Veil, uh, depending only Okay. There's a very minor asterisk here, which I might as well put now. So if you do the computations right, you, you realize that sometimes if the additive part has very large degree, typically degree uh, multiple of p, then it could be that the, uh, the degree of this polynomial uh, goes down uh, again by a multiple of p. So you should think that this is only okay when uh, the polynomials are fixed to begin with, and you let p become bigger and bigger. So this is at least if uh, degree of f1 and degree of f2 are strictly less than p. Okay, so this is a really minor thing that you should not worry about, but that is there to make the statement correct. Okay, and then in terms of this polynomial, uh, what André Veil proved, and which is really the key thing, is that uh, all zeros uh, ah. I guess this will be the pose because I did not normalize thing to make it a polynomial instead of a uh, okay, what should I do? I think the simplest. So if you really want a Riemann hypothesis that's about location of poles and not of, of zeros and not of poles, we should replace the sums by their opposite. Oh. I mean, there's a very good algebraic reason for that, which maybe we'll be able to see tomorrow. But then, of course, the point is that we do get an entire function. So we, it's with this normalization that the analog of holomorphic uh, and continuation of zeta or dash layer functions is literally true without, uh, without poles. Okay, so all zeros of L are of a real part one half. Well, it's not quite literally true. You can do some computation, let's say, for, uh, for uh, Ramanujan sums, and, you, and you'll see that that's not quite true, or zero. So it can be, it can be that there are somehow trivial zeros, which would be of modulus 1, corresponding to real part of uh, the zero being um, zero. But all of these, all the others, are real part equal to 1 half. Now, if you write uh, this polynomial as the product of 1 minus uh, zi times x for 1 to uh, capital C, OK, you can suddenly factor it this way, because p of 0 is non-zero, so you can suddenly uh, and p of 1, uh, p of 0 is 1. Then you will see immediately by taking the logarithmic derivative at 0 of this generating series that uh, the sum s, which is s1, is minus the sum of the zi's. Okay? But now, uh, modulus of zi 
well, uh, if you write in terms of L to the S, the fact that S is a zero will tell you that the modulus of the I is either the square root of P or one, corresponding to S being of real part, the corresponding S to be a real part one half or zero. And so it's immediate from that uh, that you get the bound of André Weil. And this tells you what this C should be. And in some cases, this is a way of computing it by just computing explicitly what is the generating series and finding that it is a polynomial of a given degree. So we get that the modulus of S is less than C squared of P. Okay. So I wanted to make a second basic remark now, but I think I won't have time uh, since it's already 11.30. So tomorrow I'll start with the second remark on this thing, which is the fact that somehow uh, these basic estimates is automatically useful for two other purposes, which are incomplete sums, just using the basic completing techniques, because the Fourier transform uh, of the sum end is itself of this type, of exponential sums of the same type. And it's also automatically suitable to compare two functions of the type chi of a rational function times additive character of another rational function. Because the product of two such things uh, with complex conjugate on one is again essentially of this type. And then I'll discuss a bit the lens uh, formalism and results. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. So maybe we should give ourselves five minutes break. Sure. <laughs>